um, the testing materials chapter. So this is the uh, second last line here in this materials thing, and it's called testing of materials. So you click on that and come to this page, and there's destructive testing and non-destructive testing. So looking at this um, section of a chapter out of this book uh, called destructive testing. All right, so here we are in um, looking at our first type of destructive testing, which is a ten tensile tester. Basically, you just pull the specimen and uh, see what you get. But although the tensile tester can give you quite a lot of information, so um, there's a few different arrangements for tensile testers. Here's here's a electronic, uh, electrically driven one. Uh, it has a couple of screw threads running up inside here, and um, from this top this top part goes up, pulls up this way and, uh, and the specimen goes in, in, the, in the jaws in the middle here the clamping jaws and uh, breaks apart uh, here's a manually driven one you just turn the handle and, and it pulls it it's called Hounsfield tensometer been around for millions of years no it's about probably 900s probably maybe 80 and here's a hydraulic version so um this is uh, pretty much the same idea, uh, pulling, uh, I think it's the lower jaw that goes down this time. And um, often the hydraulic ones are for compression, but you need to get some pretty uh, extreme loads when you're crushing uh, concrete cylinders and things. All right, so you can, uh, a lot of the tensile testers will do compression as well. So if it does um, tension and compression, so if it's a tensile tester, Plus compression, then they call it a universal tester because it does both tension and compression. Universal, so that's why it's called universal. Now, um, from out of the tensile tester, you get a um, a curve. And uh, we've, got, we've got an example of some curves here. Um, this bunch of curves here represents uh, different types of steel. So these are these are all steels, a whole lot of them are steels. And the reason I know that, uh, that they're all the same class of metal is because they all have the same stiffness, which is the slope of this elastic part of the line. So the slope of this line is the stiffness. So if it's steeper, then it's stiffer. And if this was steel, then um, then it would, would be a, a lot stiffer than that Vilmos vertical line. But um, they're just showing it so it's easy to see. Not so vertical. Now we have um, a bunch of different metals here, A, B, C, up to F. And F is the softest one, but it's, it's very ductile, continues along here uh, for a long time. We'll probably keep going quite, quite a lot further along in that direction before it finally breaks and it has in in the time uh, before by the time it breaks it's stretched quite a lot it might have stretched you know 20 percent of its original length longer than it is than it was before so it's quite stretchy whereas this one a probably snapped right there at the top of the curve very hard steel this one so going all the way up to this point here before it started to get deformed permanently so they've all got a fairly pronounced yield point except a and uh, these mild steels down the bottom here, very obvious yield point factor. It actually goes down after the yield point, which is um, quite distinct. <clears throat> now, uh, so from the tensile tester, we can get stiffness, which is the slope of the line. So once you've once you've drawn that line, you have you have the, uh, the stiffness. There's also toughness. Now, toughness can be determined from the graph. By measuring the area underneath the graph, so it's the underside, it's the um, it's the underneath area of a graph that is the toughness. So the larger this area in here, the tougher the material. So this is quite tough. In in fact, it's tougher than this strong one here. This has got less toughness. There's less area which means it's not as tough. 
or in other words, if something's not tough, it's brittle. So the highly, highly uh, hardened steel, which is strong steel, is brittle. So it's, it's okay to go strong, but there's a danger you can make the steel brittle. So um, when, when you go very strong. So sometimes they don't want steel to be too strong because um, it'll lose too much toughness and then it'll be um, prone to fracturing, prone to breaking. So they don't really want that to happen to the steel. So it's a it's a toss up between how hard you make it and how um, ductile you allow it to be. So maybe you might be better off with this, this steel around here, which will give you this sort of area, which is probably the toughest one of all because it's got the it's got a fair bit of ductility and it's got quite a lot of strength, which means the area in there is, is the largest of all. And that would probably be something like an 8.8 .8 ball. That's a typical, and that's what they use. They use 8.8 um, mostly, most of them. So this would be um, steels getting uh, stronger and stronger here from A up to F. Uh, and that's how the, the grass would look. So here, here we actually have the names of those steels. So A is heat treated alloy. So that's a, a highly, here they are down here, that's heat treated. And here's a heat treated nickel alloy steel. So that's chrome and tungsten. So that, that's pretty serious, mm, tungsten in there. Um, and then you're going down this and this to um, ordinary mild steel. And as they're dry, you also notice um, the more ductile um, materials have a, a breakage that's showing 45 degrees and, and it sort of rips apart when they're more ductile. So these soft ones are just kind of rips apart, whereas the uh, very hard ones, they kind of snap like a piece of chalk, just, just breaks suddenly and cleanly. All right, so... Um, These are just um, mentions about the hand school potential. We can skip that bit. Compression testing is uh, can be done on the same machine if we can if we can do tension and compression, which they usually can. Um, there there are some situations where compression testing is a bit of a problem, and one of them is that if your specimen is too long, it's not going to compress necessarily the way you expect it to. So you might have uh, a specimen, but if it's really long and skinny, then when you go to bend it, instead of, uh, sorry, when you go to squash it, instead of it squashing, it will bend out of shape. Uh, and that, when that happens, that's called buckling. So that's the first danger when you're doing compression, make sure the thing doesn't buckle. The next thing is, um, if you make it shorter, then, this surface uh, acts to to, um, to change it as well because it's holding it together. So it's the two faces that it's mounted on are strong enough to help this thing to stay together more. So it'll tend to make the the faces of this part stronger than they really are. Uh, so that's a bit misleading as well. So it's quite important that you get the right uh, height ratio of the of the um, specimen to make sure that it doesn't um, doesn't do one of those things. So um, um, fairly interesting uh, what can happen in um, compression as well. I'll give an example. If you had a piece of brass, right, and you typically make them about three times as tall as they are wide, Something like that, three to one. If you put that in compression, it you would think that it's going to end up you know, squashing like this. That sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Well, guess what? It doesn't. It does this. It does a 45 degree break. 
That's what brass does. Then why on earth does it, does it do that? Well, breaking 45 means that it's failing in shear across that plane. And things fail in shear because they have a low shear stress. The, the shear strength of the material is low. So um, brass has high compressive strength, but low shear strength. So it, while it is trying to compress it, it can't compress it anywhere near as well as it can shear it. So it decides to shear instead. Um, yeah, which is nice and annoying. If you're trying to measure compressive stress, you can't do it because it keeps measuring shear stress instead. Um, not so with mild steel. Mild steel will just um, barrel like this, just nothing on one centimeter mini. But brass is quite interesting when it does that. All right, now next type of uh, so that's your tensile test and your compression test. The tensile test is um, by far the most common. And um, it's the um, standard test for everything. And the most thing, important things you get out of it is the UTS, ultimate tensile strength, and the yield strength. That's that point where it's about to um, deform permanently. Those two are by far the most important measurements of the material. Um, and stiffness, of course, which is a very important one as well. So those three properties measured from a material are the three most important properties of the material anyway. So you bet you often can just get a tensile test, get those three measurements and that's it. That's all you need because uh, you can do a lot with that, just those three. You know the ultimate tensile strength, you know what it takes to break it. The yield strength, you know what it takes to deform it. And the stiffness, you know how much it stretches when it's under load. Probably the next most important measurement is the hardness of a uh, specimen. So what sort of hardness does the specimen have? It's hardness, of course, is a surface property. So you're trying to work out how much hardness on the surface. So you only need to measure hardness at the surface. You don't have to cut it in half or anything. And um, <clears throat> we have a couple of different ways of doing it. Um, metals of course, are ductile, so we dent them. We measure the size of the dent or the depth of the dent to tell us the, yeah, a proportion to the hardness. So the, the bigger the dent, the softer the material, the smaller the dent, the harder the material. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we've got three types. Uh, these are the three common, uh, well-known um, hardness measurement methods. We have the Brunel, the Vickers and the Rockwell. Now we do have a Rockwell machine at TAFE. We've got a video about that. Have a look at that in a sec. Brunel is a ball. Vickers is a diamond pyramid. So Brunel just pushes a ball into the surface. Measures how deep it goes. Vickers has a diamond uh, like a pyramid shaped diamond which gets pushed into the metal and then measures the dent that this diamond does into the metal surface uh, with a microscope so you measure it like the dimensions of it and uh, so that for, to do that you of course you need to have the surface clean can't be a rusty old surface you won't be able to measure the dent it will be too messy um, and then the rock well which is uh, a couple of different ones there's a ball type one now it's just a very small ball and there's a diamond, another one, which is a diamond cone shape diamond, this one. So um, that also indents into the surface, I think it's 60 degree. <coughs> or maybe 90 degrees. Anyway. Um, so the, but they're all the same idea. They're all denting the surface. Uh, this one measures the size of the surface. This, uh, the rock wall measures the depth of the dent. How, how deep does it go? That's the measure of the hardness. We've got an example of a rock wheel testing machine here. Um, the specimen is uh, put on this anvil, so that's the table that it sits on, and then that, that's the specimen sitting right there. Then there's the indenter, which is inside the tip of that, that top bit there. You can just see a little sharp point 
that's the indenter there. That's the one that's going to be uh, pushing into the metal. And then we've got this clock face at the front, which gives you the readout of the depth of uh, penetration. Now, we don't measure the depth in millimetres or anything. It's just a scale on the reading. And the scale varies depending on what setup you have, how much weight, and what sort of indenter is uh, pushing into the surface. Is it a diamond cone or is it a steel ball? Uh, we've got a few scales in the, the Rockwell. Here's, um, here's a bunch of them. Common, most common ones would be the B and C scales, particularly C. Probably C would be the most common because the hardened steel would be a C. Um, B would be for softer materials. <clears throat> but the Rockwell C, if you had a Rockwell C 55, say, you would say hardness Rockwell C 55. That would be the specification HRC 55. So if you see HRC, you know it's hardness Rockwell C scale. And the C scale is 150 kilograms with a diamond cone. Now 150 kilos with a diamond cone would be a bit much if you're pushing through uh, some fairly thin um, sheet metal, but we go right through it. So for thin materials and uh, ones that only have a surface hardness, you'd use the A scale, which is only got 60 kilograms on it, so it's not going to push right through the hard material. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, so A scale would, would uh, be used in, uh, when, you, <clears throat> when you can't push so hard. Uh, and the B scale would be used for the softer materials, that like aluminiums and brass and whatnot. All right, then you've got all the other ones. Um, uh, like the large ball, so the small ball that's a 16th of an inch, I think. Um, that's quite a small ball, a bit over a millimeter. Uh, but the larger ball, the three that's one eighth of an inch, that's three millimeter ball, and you're getting bigger and bigger for the very soft materials. Now, the advantage of the rock wells is it's very fast test, so it doesn't take much setup at all. In fact, and it's quite robust as far as. Uh, it doesn't matter if there's a bit of rust on it or uh, you know, even even a bit of paint on it can handle. So um, it's quite tolerant to, um, you know, the surface doesn't have to be polished or anything. <clears throat> and it's quite, it's quite easy to do. It doesn't take much training or special equipment and stuff. And uh, it's fairly cheap. So the rock will gets used quite a bit, particularly in a manufacturing environment when you're just double test, double checking something, you want to make sure it's okay. You just throw um, the rock will test, take you about 20 seconds to do a test, and, and it's out of there. So it's very quick and easy. <clears throat> so, there, so there it is, number two. It's faster than the other two, the Grinnell and um, the Vickers. It's nice and simple, you don't have to do any calculations. There are some limitations, for example, in the C scale, the C scale has to be between 20 and 70. So if it's less than 20 or if it's bigger than 70, then it doesn't belong in that scale. So less than 20, it's too soft for the C scale, You've got to go back to the B scale or something. And if it's um, over 70, then something's wrong as well. It's not really that hard, it's probably so soft that it looks like it's over 70, but it's actually negative negative 30 or something. It's gone a loop, it's, it's one lap of the dial, dial gauge. So that's why they have that range 20 to 70. Because if it's not in that range, then it's probably very soft, not harder than 70, because you won't get harder than 70. This is what it actually looks like when you do the rock wheel. <coughs> you um, start off with, it's much easier if, you, if you're sitting in real life, you kind of understand this, but um, here's the indenter, right? This is a steel ball indenter. And you get the test piece. Now, first thing you do is you set up the test piece and you wind it up so that this needle does about three laps. It is like three laps of the dial. One, two, three, and then you're ready. So you wound the needle right up on purpose so that when the indenter comes and pushes down, the needle is still engaged. You don't want the needle to come off and uh, hit there. Then uh, you put the weight on. So here, you, this is when the, the load is pushed on and it squashes right down into the metal. That creates a big dent. 
Then you take the load off, but the arm is still on. So it's exactly the same as this one. So you've gone back to the same as what you started with. All right, here's your, when you started, then you put the load on, then you took the load off again. This should be the same as that, but it's not because it's been dented already. So it's actually a bit further down. And so this is when you take your reading. And then you kind of do it, and that's it. So the idea there is that it takes into account, because it's taken the load of the arm already before you put the weight on, it preloads it, and that takes up um, any sort of elasticity problems or gaps, or so it sort of um, pushes everything down and uh, makes your reading more reliable. comparison here for a um, piece of mild steel which was a Rockwell um, hardness Rockwell A scale right so that's what this one is and we got a 44 in the A scale with this steel. Now Vickers was 125 hardness Vickers 30 that's the uh, size of your indented and here Brunel 123 hardness Brunel 10 3000 so that Brunel hardness is um, telling you the um, size of the dentures and the weight. Now, the um, comparison between the three of them, it actually, it actually turns out that the Brunel and the Vickers numbers are a bit more usable as far as converting this over to tensile strength. So uh, they're fairly um, predictable, whereas the, the, um, the Rockwell is <clears throat> a bit um, more hit and miss, not quite as... Uh, easy to calculate this but uh, you can still get um, conversion tables though uh, for all of them all right now um impact testing impact testing is a word for measuring toughness and uh, we already mentioned that you can measure toughness by looking at the stress drain curve you need a stress drain curve and you measure the area under the curve and that's the toughness but there's a better way to measure toughness, and that is to hit it really quickly and see if it breaks. And that's usually more useful for measuring toughness anyway, because toughness is usually a problem when it's being hit suddenly like that. So how do we um, test toughness on a specimen? Well, we have a special tester for that job, and it's called the Sharpie and Izord. Um, uh, toughness testing and this is what it looks like it's a, basically a big pendulum uh, with a hammer on it this is a, a weighted end here so this this sort of hammer head there and this is tied right up to the top here so it's, it's hanging up here and then you push the trigger and it swings down and breaks through the specimen there's your specimen right at the bottom there and knocks it off this is set up as an eyes on test because the specimen is sitting up um, vertical like that and it's a round specimen and the specimen would look like this it's a, a piece of round rod with a little with a little cut in it at the front and so when the hammer comes down and hits it at the top here that cut starts the crack off and it cracks right through so the cut helps it to break at the right in the right place um, so it doesn't uh, muck up now how this machine works is we know the height or the angle that it's uh, sitting at to start with and then when it's finished its swing we measure how far it got to now it was supposed to get up to here if it if there was nothing there if it didn't if there was nothing to hit but because it's hit something it's wasted this much energy and what is toughness how much energy it takes to break so here is actually the 
energy, gravitational energy, that's been lost when it broke the specimen. And that will tell you how much toughness that specimen has. So if specimen is very tough, the hammer will slow down a lot. If the specimen is not very tough, the hammer will barely slow down and almost swing to the original height, which means that the, the toughness is low. Now, um, this became uh, another reason that this, this type of test was um, instigated was because they wanted to be able to do it really quickly. The reason they wanted to do it fast is because they discovered that when metal was cold, it lost toughness. So they would have specimens cooled down to, you know, freezing temperatures. Like minus 30, minus 50, minus 80, minus 100. See these temperatures down here, minus 120. So they're not going to stay at that temperature very long in the tensile test. So, but in, the, in this thing, they can throw it in the jaw really quickly, hit the hammer trigger and uh, snap it in half uh, in, you know, like a second. So it doesn't, they don't be waiting around uh, while the metal warms up. So that's another reason we use impact testing. Because so fast, we can have these specimens heated or cooled to the right temperature. Now what's going on here is they're finding that there's a cooling point for these different metals where, you know, for example, metal A, if if it reaches this temperature down here at minus 40, it's pretty cold, then it suddenly becomes very brittle. It loses a whole lot of toughness. So it was really nice and tough up here, great looking material up here, really high value toughness, but boo, it just loses it all at minus 40 degrees. Now, if it's never gonna to get to minus 40, you're fine. But what about metal B? It loses all its toughness at 20 degrees. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? There's going to be plenty of places where it's going to get to 20 degrees and suddenly metal B loses its toughness. So they would have, they would prefer to have these sorts of ones here. If you're making a ship or you know, aircraft parts or something, um, you want something that's not going to lose toughness until it's at some crazy temperature like minus 80, which hopefully won't happen. Yep, so there's the Izod, um yeah, so I just drew it, but there's a picture of it right there, just hitting the top of it. The other way to do it, of course, is a Sharpie test. Uh, it can be virtually the same machine, uh, just with a modified hammer. And in this case, you have a square specimen that's hit from the back with a cut in the front of the specimen, and that snaps it as well. <clears throat> Just uh, two different ways of setting up uh, a specimen to break while it's being um, hit with an impact. Right, now the next type of test is a fatigue test. A fatigue test means that you repeatedly load something on and off for a very large number of cycles. Now, you may be aware that if you were trying to break a piece of wire and you couldn't have, any, you didn't have any pliers with you, so you just get the piece of wire and you bend it backwards and forwards. By the time you bend it backwards and forwards about 20 times, it will have snapped. Well, that's not fatigue. That's work hardening. Fatigue is a lot more than 20 cycles. Fatigue is usually about 100,000 cycles or more. Most often, millions of cycles. So, and the difference is, when you were bending that piece of wire, you were going way over the yield point because you bent the wire. And then when you bend it back the other way, you bent the wire again past the yield point. So you kept going past the yield point. So when you're bending a piece of wire backwards and forwards, let's say this is mild steel, you were going up to about here and then dropping off, and then back up, and then dropping off, and then back up, and then dropping You're doing it up here somewhere until finally it's snap. But when you're talking about fatigue, it's down here, going up and down, down here, under the yield point. You never go over the yield point. If you go over the yield point, it's not fatigue. So you're way below the yield point, going up and down, up and down, up and down and here, so many times it finally breaks. 
<clears throat> so there is a thing called a fatigue limit, which is the point if you if your stress is under the fatigue limit, as long as you stay under the fatigue limit, it won't break. Uh, but this is well and truly under the yield point. The yield point might be about here, but it's not very yield stress. And that, of course, is the ultimate tensile strength because that's the takes one go to break it. In this one. Yeah. Oh, this is millions. Notice this is millions of cycles here. There's a couple of different ways of doing fatigue as well. You can uh, give it full tension, full compression, full tension, full and just keep doing that. You might be doing that you know, at a thousand RPM, so you're doing whatever that is, 50, 50 a second or something. Um, or it might be tension and then off, tension and then off. Or it might be high tension, low tension, etc. So there's a, a number of different ways of putting the um, fatigue forces on the specimen. Here's a few different types of metals and uh, what their fatigue curves might be and the maximum stress that they can have. So this this specimen A is pretty good stuff because I can run it at uh, what about 630 megapascals and it looks like it's going to be indefinite. Just keep going on in that direction. And here we are at 10 at, at 100 million cycles. Whereas uh, G, poor old G, is not letting it go very far. Is it? You know, we can only handle that, you know, what, that 50 megapascals or so. And it still looks like it's going to fail soon. <clears throat> so there's quite a bit of difference. So if you've got something like an engine part, that's why most stuff in an engine is made of steel, because steel behaves more like this. This would be, G would be something like an aluminium. Here we have G is grey cast iron, I should say. So uh, it's not very good for inside an engine. And F is copper, and E is aluminium. See, aluminium is uh, heading downhill really fast there. Now, when uh, fatigue happens, the way it happens is that um, there's some sort of origin for, for the crack here, and then the crack slowly grows, and that's why you're getting these concentric rings around here. Because the crack's slowly growing its way out. Now it could take, you know, a hundred million cycles or more for this crack to grow, so a couple of atoms at a time. And then finally, it gets to the point where there's not much metal left, and all of this stuff just rips. Uh, this is a very rough surface here, so you get this smooth crack growth, which is the gradual fatigue crack, and then you get the rough. Um, catastrophic failure because there's not enough metal at the, at the end and just breaks uh, next time it started probably. Right now um, to improve um, a situation where you're getting fatigue failure you can um, you can fix the surface finish if you have um, a rough surface finish that can be an invitation for crack to start Particularly like if you're in a lathe, the, the tool itself can leave like a miniature thread. And uh, and and they're all just cracks waiting to start. So give it a better surface finish. You can also do surface treatment, which is um, to, so the surface is less likely to start a crack. So you can put a hard layer on the surface, like chrome plating, for example. Or you can put stress in it. And this is called peening. When you... Uh, compress the surface because it's in compression then it's less likely to have tension and tension is what causes cracks and then in geometry uh, you want to get rid of sharp corners and you know you know like let's say you're doing a bolt head that's not very good is it because that the shank there in the bolt there's a sharp corner in there so if you have a high performance bolt you might do this sort of thing have the bolt head stepped in and then here you have a radius into the bolt so that you don't have this sharp corner in there. That sort of thing. Here's an actual uh, tense, uh, fatigue testing machine. You've got a shaft that's just spun with an electric motor. That's it. And then just run it. You've got weights uh, pulling on it. So 
the worst like this you have <clears throat> the motor driving this shaft the shaft is spinning and with bearings on it <clears throat> and those bearings are pushing down so this here is under bending all, the whole time so it's sort of doing that while it's spinning so it's right now it's in tension at the bottom and compression at the top but the time it's done 180 degrees what it was in compression is now in tension so the whole time tension compression tension compression tension compression at like you know a thousand reps per minute so you just run it like that for weeks and weeks and uh, eventually it breaks of course if you're trying to measure you know that it's done 800 million cycles it could take quite a long time in fact you could you could actually run the bearings out run through the lifetime of the bearing you have to replace the bearing and keep running the machine just to get that one point on the graph so it's a fairly uh, laborious job working out those fatigue graphs this is uh, just working out the bending moment on that uh, on that um pencil oh, on that uh, fatigue test all right now another one is Creep, creep, we have mentioned creep in the um, properties uh, chapter, <clears throat> fatigue and creep. Now creep, remember, was um, a gradual stretch. Fatigue is a gradual crack. Creep is a gradual stretching. And uh, works <clears throat> like a curve here. You have um, in the three stages of creep. You've got the primary stage or the first stage, secondary, second stage and tertiary third stage <clears throat> and to uh, start off with it just um, sort of slows down then it goes at a constant speed in the secondary stage and then the tertiary when it starts to accelerate means you're in trouble get rid of it take it out of service just helps you to predict uh, when's the best time to get it get it replaced And here's a creep testing machine. Now, of course, when you're testing creep, uh, it's usually temperature related, so um, you have to do it with some sort of heater, usually. <clears throat> so we've got uh, creep for a particular uh, material here, and as the temperature goes up, it takes less stress to cause it to creep. So at 500 degrees, it's about you know 120 megapascals or something, or 500. And 450, you can go to about 200 megapascals, etc. Pretty boring test, though. I mean, just sit there watching it stretch slowly. All right, so that's really just a quick coverage of the um, non of the destructive um, testing methods we'll just uh, have a quick look at the page itself um we mentioned the Hounsfield tensometer here is the Hounsfield that we have at TAFE uh, with the instructions on it um the actual graph of the Hounsfield here's, here's a specimen um before and after so you can tell it's stretched quite a bit this piece of brass but the the actual brass itself off the Hounsfield is elastic there the yield point is probably around here somewhere and then it starts stretching out and then it starts to tail off because it's necking and then finally breaks here so different uh, we've got different ones here we've got another a brass here which is nowhere near as ductile so it went up pretty much in a straight line and then started to bend off <clears throat> another brass here very ductile one now here we went up to here and then we when we wound off and then we came back up again it was now work hardened we've been work hardened and that's why we ended up back at the same line but after that just continues um that work hardening plot so there's a bunch of different um Hounsfield tensometer tests there <clears throat> now as um Another one here, which is a bending test. Now, this bending test is really just like a bridge. So you just load the, the here's a bunch of uh, cross sections. We've got a couple of aluminium extrusions, a piece of steel bar, two pieces of steel bar, and a piece of wood. And uh, we're measuring the amount of deflection that they go, they undergo when it's loaded up. So here's the uh, specimen sitting on these um, two points. 
and then we're using a dial indicator to measure the amount of deflection of that beam when we put weight on it. So a fairly simple concept. Now the same idea it is in torsion. So we have a specimen which is just a, a rod, a brass rod, a quarter inch diameter. And uh, you put a torque on it with, with a cable and a weight, and that causes um, a torsion. Here, here's the weight here, which is causing a turning effect, and we twist that shaft, and we measure the amount of twist in the shaft by <coughs> measuring the angle. And um, and we use that to uh, get the properties of the uh, of the metal. And uh, as I mentioned, the hardness test, this hardness test is the Hounsfield at, um, that we have at TAFE, and it's a video here, which um, you can go through uh, on, on how to uh, run that machine, which uh, pretty much looks the same as that. There's that picture out of that book. And um, these are some of the readings that we had. Worth having a look at this table here. Um, we've got mild steel, stainless steel, la da da da, right? And we measured them in two scales. Now remember this, the C scale was only between 20 and 70, right? So have a look at this mild steel. In the B scale, we got 79, 85, 83, okay, they're valid readings. In the C scale, we got 93, 6, and 4. Now how is that possible? Well, that's because the 93 isn't really 93. It's actually negative 7, because the scale goes from 0 to 100, right? Which means if you're really low, you might be 6 or 4. But if you keep going below 4, you go 3, 2, 1, 0, which is 100. Then you're going to go 99, 98, 97, 96, down to 93. So that's actually, a, a, wasn't really 93, it was negative 7. But you can't. You can't read a negative 7 off the dial. You can only read whatever number it's pointing at, which is 93. So be careful. If something's really soft and you get a C scale of 93, that's ridiculously impossible. First of all, it doesn't go over 70. And if even at 70, the dot will be almost invisible because it's so hard. So if it's 93, you shouldn't see any dot at all. It'll be midget. And if you've got this great big dent and it's reading 93, then it isn't 93, it's negative 7. So uh, that's why they give you the range 20 to 70. And it's not in that range. So none of those numbers are between 20 and 70, nor the next line as well. So those two metals are way too soft for the C scale. Whereas the hardened carbon steel hardened shaft was 55, 58. That's hard. And what about this one? HSS, high speed steel. This is a, just a piece of lathe tool. And we got readings of 64, 65. So yes, that's a nice hard reading on C scale. All right. Now um, I did mention the uh, impact tester. I do have a example right here. Here's a uh, how the impact tester basically works. You uh, let it go and it smashes through the part, and then you measure what height did it get up to after it swung. Now the, the gauge itself is, is um, marked out in joules, so you can measure the joules straight off the chart, not in degrees. So this is set up as a Sharpie test, so which is um, a square block. And the hammer's up at a point, you release the hammer, it goes down, breaks the specimen in two, and then you measure how far it swings up to. It stops there with a bit of clutch, so you know, or it moves the bar, so you know how far it's gone. All right, so um, that's destructive testing. Let me stop the video there.